Welcome to the Sunday special on Top Med Talk. It's a potpourri of our favourite longer pieces, ideal for downloading and enjoying when you have a little bit more time. Top Med Talk. Thank you very much, Monty. So we're going to flip back across the Atlantic now from a UK perspective back to the US. It's a great pleasure to introduce Lee Fleischer. He's the Chair and DRIPS Professor of Anesthesia at Penn. He'll be familiar to many of you from his role in contributing to and indeed chairing many of the cardiac risk guidelines and also has a particular uh, interest in health economics and I think that's going to be the focus of the presentation today. Uh, Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. It's sort of ironic that Sal talked about the patient and I talk about the money. So for those who know us, I usually talk about the patient, he usually talks about the money. Um, And I'm going to put the money in an interesting context because I'm going to talk about a lot of the policy implications, and I've worked on many of these uh, at the National Quality Forum and with CMS, and talk about how we can think about it as we go forward in perioperative medicine. Uh, Some of you have seen me debate Zev Kane around the perioperative surgical home. The problem, in my mind, was we start with the money. We start with this is where we actually see healthcare going, and given that it's all about the bundle, let's see how much we can get in the bundle. And what I think is great, ironically, is we start with Saul talking about the patient and Monty pivoting and again talking about the patient, although that slide of 2017, and how within the confines of the current structure on payment in the U.S., how do we ensure we can continue to do this work and get paid for it? Because if we do the work first, which we should, we want to make sure how we optimize the ability to continue it by the reimbursement scheme. Now, I don't know if you've seen this because it's relatively new, but the problem is the problem. The percent of money that's going to be spent on health care was just updated in the last about three months. This was published in Health Affairs. So our health care expenditure in the U.S. is projected to grow 5.5% over the next decade to get to the level of $5.7 trillion. Now, that would be fine if our GDP is going to grow. But when you put the two things together, that health care is going to grow 1% faster than GDP over that same time period. And I'll show you a graph Uh, from uh, CMS and the National Health Statistics. So we're going to rise from 17.9% of GDP to Uh, 19.7%. Is that sustainable? And can people afford and um, can industry afford to support that level of growth? So you you see this, and the other problem is that the percent that states and local governments are going to fund is going to go up to 47% from 45%. And while the federal government keeps raising the debt ceiling and funds a lot of these things, the states can't raise their debt ceiling. They can't actually have a debt. So essentially Medicaid, which funds a lot of our work, and we know how we get paid by Medicaid for our work, which is at about 80 cents on the dollar, we lose money on Medicaid, that's going to be under increased pressure. So the more that we can solve and take the waste out of the system, the better it is not only for our federal government and our patients, but also for our state governments, which can't afford it. So that's something to think about within the overall construct. And this is just a, a graph that nicely illustrates it, showing again this rise from, you see the dip that occurred down here around 2008 to 2010, which was around the, the, um, the recession that occurred, and that was some of the changes, but that our rate of growth will be higher than GDP growth and lead to a rise in overall expenditures. In fact, if you look, there was a paper written by Uwe Reinhardt who passed away in the last six months and who wrote the original paper with Jerry Anderson, my mentor at Johns Hopkins, that it's about the price is stupid in the U.S. compared to other countries. Ashish Jha has just updated that and again showed it's about the prices. So we have to be very sensitive that the federal government 
is hearing it's about what we cost or what we charge them and what they pay. So how do we actually utilize that to say, do we do inappropriate care? Which is, if you talk to the Walmarts of the world, and when I talk to Comcast, what they want to know is not how you can give me less money per widget, but are all the widgets needed? Do we really need to do all the laminectomies, all the back surgeries that's currently done now? And that's why they're developing programs with places like Virginia Mason of second opinions that can we actually say, and Monty, I think you nicely said it, can we say, is this procedure going to lead to a better quality of life for the individual? And that's what Walmart, that's what Comcast, that's what these major centers believe a great center of excellence does. That's their definition, which is not our definition. Our definition is we're special. So again, this is just the other thing, that this is still going to be driven by private insurance. The negative is you will see that the projection was that the number of uninsured will go up in 2026. We're going in the wrong direction compared to the rest of the world, but it'll still be driven. 201 million people will have private insurance. So when you think about it, and these slides were shared to me by Patrick Conway. He unfortunately left CMS. Um, there is not many people left at CMS who actually understand fully the extent to which to pivot for Medicare. Kate, that some of the, the leads out of CMMI, they're just getting a new head. But this idea from going from producer-centered, incentive for volume, unsustainable, fragmented care, and really this is all about defragmenting care. That's the thing that you can make a huge contribution towards, to that incentive for uh, outcomes, patient-centered, sustainable care. And I'll talk about some of these systems and how as you develop some of the things that they really have done at Duke, that they have already done at the UK, where should you go to talk about that that you may get the resources to do it. That's what I think this lecture's about. Now, the other thing that's really interesting is how much we spend on social services. And um, I will give you my bias. My hope is we get to more population health because I think that is the thing that will lead to better outcomes. That in the US, you can see that our total expenditures on health care and social services is not that different than the rest of the world. We're actually equal to about the rest of the world or we're in the middle of the pack. The thing is we've flipped it. We can't pay for care. We don't pay for health. And if you are responsible for a population, if, for example, your Boston Children's, I was just talking, my cousin actually is the chair of pediatrics up there, and they have a Medicaid ACO, and they're now responsible for taking care of these kids. You may pay for dental care, because in children, poor dental care, dental caries, can actually lead to worse outcomes. The smoking that Saul talks about, some of these clinics are huge, and if you're Geisinger, and you're both the care deliverer and the insurer, you may buy a patient a refrigerator. You may actually, what some people have done is they've gone to blue, um, the, they supply food after you can order it on, online. Blue Apron. There are centers that actually have started to send patients home with Blue Apron meals to improve their healing after surgery. Really interesting concept, but if you get paid for the total bundle, it makes sense. If you get paid fee for service, you never do it. So in fact, people have looked at this. This is a wonderful sort of analysis. How can we work with the entire perioper the entire health and change that paradigm? And payment will drive this. How much you're in an advanced payment model will make a difference. This is the idea of how we'll be paid, because that's how it was asked for. This is the uh, 
payment to provider, no link to value. You know, I'll show you CMS and, and sort of Sibelius's approach that we're getting to value payment. That really is only 2 to 3%. That while we say 30% of our care, 50% of our care is paid, it's actually that 2 to 3% margin. So if you do more volume, you can overcome the negative payments around quality-based care. The alternative payment models is the bundles. That's in three. Now, we know that Secretary Price, being an orthopedic surgeon, did not want anything to interfere with the independence of physicians. And that's why he was against bundles. He actually thought bundles work from everyone I know at CMS. He was in favor, but he wanted it voluntary. And we know that Azor and the current administration is now thinking again, and I'll show you some of the new bundles that have come up. And lastly, population-based, and anybody here from Maryland? One person, you have an interesting system. But it could become the model for the country and people need to be aware of it. So this idea and this goal of getting to 85% linked to value-based purchasing is only the 2 to 3% that's attached to MIPS. It's only a, to that small percent that's attached to the change in the total amount of money you will receive from Medicare in the payment update. But it was the first step. And again, this goal of 2018, some people will say it's true, it's 90%, but others will not. In fact, Saul's co-author, Mark McClellan, said, you know, CMS will move a little bit but he actually got industry, the insurance industry, to move even faster than CMS. So if you think that because CMS underpriced slowed things, you should talk to AHIP, the Association of Health Insurance Providers. You should talk and to your local blues or to Aetna. They are actually going to accelerate it. My CEO does not want to say we have any population health um, programs, but we're responsible for 160,000 lives under our Blue Cross contract. It's a different name for the same thing. We are responsible for their total cost of care, and I'll talk about where we can make a difference there. The thing that CMS learned and the CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations learned, is it works that as you actually do these alternative payment models, as they actually started to ask the question and attach it to payment and people focused, there was marked improvement in VAP, in early delivery by C-section, central line. I mean, everyone says that 15 years ago, we couldn't eliminate central line infections, and they are much, much lower. Now, the interesting question, is it Peter Pronovost in the checklist, or do you read Mary Dixon Wood's work, who's from Oxford, where she says it's actually a culture, it's the campaign that makes the difference? And can you change the culture in your hospital, in part by developing all the things that Saul and Monty talked about for the country or for Duke? So these are all the opportunities and the pivots, and under the current ACA, and I apologize for the small slides, these are all the things that CMMI, which has a right to turn them on, it's up to the secretary if it works, but pioneer ACOs, the Accountable Care Organization, Medicare Shared Savings Programs. You may in your state be aware that there may be special programs for dual eligibles, people on Medicare and Medicaid, so that's the poor elderly, but also they may have a program, our blues do, on diabetics. And Saul's Diabetes Clinic at Duke may be optimally set up to actually integrate and take advantage of that Medicare population in which there is a special bundle or care program for those diabetics who are undergoing surgery. So as I talk more and more, think about as you talk to your leaders, 
at, who are doing the insurance contracting, are there programs around special populations that we can have shared savings? The homage to some who have discussed with me in which you will give us resources for helping take care of them from a population-based perspective. Now, Merlin, fascinating. Merlin has always been an all-payer state. So what does that mean? That means that they can't make a lot of money in the hospitals and they can't lose a lot of money. In fact, as you get to the end of the fiscal year, the amount of money charged per day, the per diem room charge, actually changes to the insurance company. And that all the insurance companies pay the same as Medicare. So it's an all payers pay the same to allow a certain amount of money or benefit to, Med to Merlin and Merlin hospitals at the end of the year, which means Hopkins can't make 12% margin, but they don't have a negative margin. So they entered into in 2014, a new model, which says we are going to be actually allocated a population, and we are responsible for the total care of that population. And if we actually live within the budget we get, and they got like $2 billion more for the state, maybe more, that we will actually manage it just like an ACO, population health, from Medicare and all of the providers. So the way they can make money is actually getting international patients, which works for Hopkins but doesn't work for Franklin Square, save money by actually doing less surgeries or less post-acute care, or, in fact, having a larger population that they're caring for. In 2019, assuming it goes through, the, is the infamous waiver and in 2019, they're going to be responsible for the hot, the uh, excuse me, the physician spend also. So they are experimenting in which they're saying you're responsible for a whole state. Now they actually do well without a state patients too. But just imagine that if this proves to work in 10, 15 years, and in this audience, it's hard to know how many of us will still be practicing, um, but. That's mainly about me. Um, but the question becomes, will we actually have to manage to an entire population just get one budget and say to the hospital, figure it out yourselves? That's what's happened in Maryland. Now, we know that they had for hips and needs the BPCI, the Bundled Payment for Care Improvement. There were four models. One of the biggest problems is that it was retrospective payment. They actually saw how much you spent and went backwards and took money away or paid you more. That post-acute care, and I'll talk about MedPAC, and MedPAC is the Medicare Payment Advisory Committee. It's actually the commission that advises Congress uh, on payment policy, has said post-acute care is the real problem. If you were to look at it, that hospitals, and I'm sure you know your hospitals are making anywhere from a small loss to 4 to 5% margin if you're doing incredibly well. Well, acute care, post-acute care, they're making 15% because there are no bundles. There are no DRGs. They get paid on a per diem basis still. So the best place for you to look if you're going to try to control the entire perioperative process and take money out of the system is look at that post-acute care and decide if patients really need it. In fact, one of the things that I've suggested to our managed care contracting committee is that we get new contracts in which patients go to the care providers that we say, or they have to pay more if they go outside of our network. Novel idea. It's actually forcing a change in how we contract. But the issue is that there's such wide variability in cost, in utilization, in readmissions from post-acute care. 
it's a huge place that we can make great movement from a patient care perspective and financial. In fact, when they did this, there was a paper, Patrick Conway, the former um, acting administrator and chief medical officer of CMS, said that in the first seven quarters, compared to matched institutions, it saved money with no decline in quality, and really said this is the way to go. Now, CMS just this year, on the 9th of January, released what is the next generation of the bundled care. It's the new payment model to improve quality coordination cost effectiveness, i.e. it's going to save us money because it's CMS. And these are all the new places that you can have bundles. So it's not just about hips and knees. It actually includes double joints, cabbages, uh, uh, major bowel procedures, and you can opt in to any of these programs. So it'll be interesting to see over the course, and you want to be engaged in your, with your hospital leadership to say, what are we going to be involved in? Which of these bundles? It even includes, looking down here at the bottom, outpatient, back and neck. Now, the interesting thing about that is, are people familiar with the two midnight rule? So if you actually do not stay two days in the hospital, two midnights, they don't pay you as an inpatient, they pay you as an outpatient. So we're having discussions with CMS now to say that won't allow us to innovate around getting to one day length of stays. Because effectively, and your hospitals, I bet, are no different than mine, are saying keep people in the hospital one more day so that we don't worry about being paid as an outpatient. Because if they're on the outpatient list, they can be there. But we have to go in, and I urge you to try to help your administrators to say, we can get down to one day, but outpatient doesn't make sense. Let's try to fix this. So as I said, I'm very intrigued by ACOs. Can we get to a population health-based environment? This idea that we're going to for health, not health care, that post-acute alignment, all the preoperative. I mean, if, if Saul sees somebody, if at Duke you go into a clinic, you don't need surgery, but your diabetes is under better control, that's a win-win all around. More appropriate care and a healthier patient. That's what we have to focus on because of that coordination. And who should pay for that? We should find out where in the contracts they actually save money and look for that contribution margin. This is just all the ACOs in the country. This is uh, the Medicare ACOs. There are actually ACOs with private insurers. Um, Tim Ferriss, who's at Partners ACO uh, at Mass General, has done an analysis of whether it makes a difference. And what you see, and this is the interesting thing about a lot of our, uh, this work, is that it actually takes about a year of a person being in a particular model for them to actually achieve benefit. For example, if we do more um, behavioral health, that's not going to have an, in our primary care, and I'll talk about that in a minute, that's not going to have an effect tomorrow. It's going to have an effect about a year from now. And we need to keep people in the same insurer, and that's one of the things that's going to be important in the future. This idea of the patient-centered medical home and integrating everything together. I talk to our medical students, and it's great that we can give them more effective medications, but if they can't afford it and they don't take it, they're less effective. When effectiveness is just not a randomized trial, it's a real-world ask of what happens when they go home, and that includes prehabilitation, that includes post-discharge exercise. So CPC Plus is a very important program. It's actually uh, around the patient-centered medical home. It's the idea of an integration of all payers in an area, and they say, which is important in this payment redesign components in the bottom, that we're going to pay you an extra per beneficiary per month. So if you ever hear someone say, 
PBPM, that's per beneficiary per month. So they give us more money up front with the hope, it's about $2 per month with the, per beneficiary, with the hope that we will actually save money downstream. Now, if we do, there's performance-based incentive payments in this CPC+. Plus. And there's also additional payment redesign. But one of the things that we've done is we've put in our center behavioral social workers. Because think about it. One of the biggest expenditures today is around pain, back pain, opiate abuse. Who better than to be involved is us? And wouldn't it be novel if actually we use behavioral health, which usually is paid for in a different mechanism, and therefore the social workers, so it's not a charge, but behavioral health to reduce those costs. So as you may remember, there was the doc fix, the need to fix the fact that Medicare had this strange formula that you had to get a cut. It went down to 21%. If we didn't fix it, doctor's fees, we already get paid uh, very low by Medicare. So they went to this idea of macro, this idea of sustainable growth, and that they changed it and said, said, you need to get to MIPS. We're going to rate you on quality, resource use, and clinical practice advancement. We're going to rate you by your Social Security number. So, for example, at Penn, where we're one practice group, we can actually bill out as smoking cessation in the primary care clinic and anesthesiologists get credit. So as you hear people question whether macro works, the problem is almost nobody is using macro or quality metrics related to their specialty because of the way it actually goes to the tax ID. And that's why the American College of Surgeons is so against it. It's not being effectively used. And in anesthesia, it's the entire group, whatever the tax ID and however large you are. That these are the weightings in quality measures, resource use, practice improvements, and EHRs. Um, the percentage cut goes up with every year if you don't participate. That, in fact, the other way to not have to be part of MACRA is if you have a large percentage of your billings in an alternative payment model. These are all the examples, the shared savings, ESRD, the ACOs. And these are some of the practice improvement activities. Expanded practice access could be one of them, population management, monitoring health conditions, being part of an alternative payment model, using checklists like a surgical checklist. This came from CMS and the secretary. So if you say you have now implemented the WHO checklist, you've done the quality improvement activity. This is a list of all the AQI, the Anesthesia Quality Institute measures. I believe these slides are shared. Um, so you can see this. You see it's mainly process measures. Few, two, outcome measures. So what we're getting credit for is checking the box. For those of us who are in MPOG, it's more about um, outcome measures and effective clinical care because it's directly from our EHR. So MPOG has a quality database. But I'll finish with this. MedPAC, so the Medicare Payment Advisory Committee, has actually voted 14 to 2 to junk Macro and MIPS. So Macro and MIPS is the only recent bipartisan bill that has gotten unbelievable support. And then after it's been implemented. This is really coming from the American College of Surgeons strongly, and it's really about the fact that it's not achieving what it's set out to be. People are not using these quality metrics. And the idea of being paid, and I was asked recently, should we be paid more if we check the box that we did ERAS? I have a very hard time saying we should be paid more. I just hopefully convinced you we can't afford to be. What we should be doing is getting a piece of the savings by getting our hospitals to go into bundles, to go into population health, and saying we can save you money. That's the way to go. 
So we don't know if this will happen, but I will tell you the way Ashish, um, the last thing I'll say is Ashish Jha has proposed, he's a health policy guru at Harvard, that patient satisfaction with our overall care should be one of the determinants of whether or not we get our full payment. And my belief is if you go heavily into perioperative medicine, they will be extremely satisfied with their care. Thank you. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading and listening to Top Med Talk. Don't forget to find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, even got our own YouTube channel. Whichever your favorite social media feed is, we're bound to be there. Find us. Also, subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode. And make sure you go to the Top Med Talk website, topmedtalk.com. And get on board with the email updates. Oh, whilst you're at it as well, I suggest you download our entire back catalogue. We're categorising at the moment. We're having a little look through it. It may not always be in the form that you currently find it. So if you get your hard drive ready for a full-on download via the website, perhaps, or perhaps through your podcatcher. Oh, and if you fancy meeting us, why not go to the website, ebpom.org forward slash meetings. Our next big event is EBPOM USA, the Dallas Masters course, a perioperative care practicum. Have a look for details of that and some of the other meetings coming up across the next year. EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.